Okay, thank you. Tom, dear friends, dear colleagues, I have a lecture on ultrasound and its role in staging. And the next speaker, Vincent van der Kay, will be speaking about diffuse weighted imaging and ovarian cancer staging. So it is like to drive Škoda and to drive Lamborghini, I feel. But I would like to provide you our best evidence we have for ultrasound. What are the goals of staging and, Im and imaging? The first goal is to confirm the presence of a malignant tumor and uh, to exclude that it is an extragenital tumor. Like in this case, this is a patient with a history of a sigmoid colon and she has this multilocular solid tumor with uh, high perfusion in the solid portion. So in case you have a doubt, you have a suspicion of extragenital tumor, you may provide a site-specific diagnosis before the surgery using minimal invasive approach, which is the true cut uh, biopsy guided by ultrasound with high adequacy, accuracy, and safety. However, you shouldn't puncture an er early stage. You should always make the biopsy from advanced tumor, from tumor or metastatic lesion. The third aim is to assess uh, extent of disease, and you should pay the attention to the loca localities which are not suitable for primary surgery and it will be the main topic. And you should also take care about possible complications like hydronephrosis, the dilation of the bowel, and inform the clinicians about it. And the hydronephrosis is surely the most encounter problem. According to NCCN guidelines, there are imaging methods recommended for staging if we have suspicious ovarian mass. And these are chest imaging and ultrasound and or other additional imaging techniques as uh, whole body MRIs, contrast enhanced CT or PET CT. However, ultrasound can be used not only for detection of ovarian mass, but also to stage a disease. However, we need experience examining. We use the other imaging methods if we have poor resolution on ultrasound or if we have suspicion of extra abdominal tumor spread. In order to assess the extent of disease in pelvis and abdomen, we must combine transvaginal scan with transabdominal scan. And in cases we are not able to insert the probe transvaginally, we can use the transrectal probe, which is the same probe as for the transvaginal scan, just inserted in the rectum without any preparation, without clisma, without starving. And uh, the image quality is identical to transvaginal approach. There, are, there is review if you would like to get some knowledge on how to scan for gynecological cancer. And there is also another article, and within this article is a structured report, how should look the structured report from the ultrasound staging. Do we have any evidence about accuracy of ultrasound in staging? To be honest, we do not have much evidence. There is a paper from, it is a multi-center study, but it was already published in 2000. And uh, in this study, they compared CT, MRI, and uh, ultrasound. It was a radiological study. And the study concluded that CT and MRI are more accurate than ultrasound particular in the subdiaphragmatic ratio in the assessment of the visceral surface of liver. However, the accuracy of ultrasound was high in the study. And uh, they recommended that ultrasound can be used to supplement this uh, imaging, these other imaging methods. And I think it is still true. And then there is another study published by Antonia Testa. And this is a very important study showing us, it is a single unit study, showing us that uh, ultrasound has capacity to stage the disease in different intra-abdominal uh, sites. And uh, she, she found satisfactory agreement with the intraoperative findings and with histology in her study. But during the lecture, I would like to provide you with the evidence from 
study which was recently now analyzed. It is a prospective study from Prague, uh, which uh, in this study we have used for staging only chest uh, X-ray and ultrasound protocol for staging. And the gold standard uh, was surgery from the primary site reduction. And this is the largest ultrasound study up to date, included almost 400 patients, Mo maj maj majority of them in advanced stage, which is important. And during the lecture, I will show you some important results. And we start first with the staging of pelvis. In order to examine not only the gynecological organs, and I don't want to speak about ovaries because we heard a lot and we will hear today, in order to detect the gynecological organs and the non-gynecological adjacent organs, there are currently exist only two imaging methods which provide us with detailed pelvic anatomy. And it is ultrasound, transvaginal scan or transrectal scan and MRI. I will focus directly on the, on the assessment of peritoneal infiltration and rectosigmoid wall. The peritoneal infiltration is called carcinomatosis, I mean the infiltration by a cancer, and is divided according to the location of peritoneum in the parietal, which is usually in the pouch of Douglas or in the parietal site of the of the pelvis or mesenterial, like in the mesentery of the sigmoid colon, mesentery of the, of the rectum, and in the viscera, on the surface of the viscera, of the surface of the rectosigmoid colon. Valentina Chiapa presented last year during the World Congress a study which she performed in Prague. And this is very important study showing that ultrasound and MRI are reliable technique to, to assess the peritoneal carcinomatosis in posterior compartment. However, ultrasound was even better and showed better agreement with histology in the assessment of rectosigmoid infiltration and specifically in the assessment of depth of infiltration. And we also noticed in the study that ultrasound was capable to detect the infiltration in the all five layers, while MRI was able only to detect the infiltration in three layers, serosa, muscularis propria, and then the third layer was the combination of the submucosa, muscularis mucosa, and mucosa. And Valentina received a prize for this study last year in Barcelona. And this is a video showing you the carcinomatosis on ultrasound. So, uterus, posterior wall, the probe is inserted in the vagina, and in the pouch of Douglas, there are hypoechoic nodules in the parietal peritoneum of the pouch of Douglas. And this is the intraoperative view. The posterior wall of the uterus is fixed to the rectum and to the infiltrated epiploics. The Douglas is completely obliterated. And the carcinomatosis spreads further on the rectum and sigmoid colon. So this is the sigmoid colon and this the muscle layer, the hypoechoic muscle layer already disappears. So we need, we will need the resection of the rectosigmoid because the infiltration is deep coming into the muscle layer. And the sigmoid colon is covered diffusely like sheet-like by carcinomatosis coming probably from this malignant ovarian mass from the left ovary. And if we will move now ventrally in the ventral, in the anterior compartment, this is the uterus, and we move the probe in the sagittal view to the anterior compartment. There is the plica vesicouterina, which is completely infiltrated by the carcinomatosis. It is marked with a cycle. So there is the uterus, and this is ticked Plica uh, with high perfusion, and there is the intraoperative view showing us the infiltration of the vesicouterine plica, which then needs peritonectomy in the anterior compartment. So this is this video, and I will show you the specimen. According to the ultrasound, you are able to predict the need of rectosigmoid resection and the need of this posterior modified exenteration. This is the left tumor, the right ovary, 
completely obliterate the pouch of Douglas, the posterior wall of the uterus, and there is the rectum removed, and there was anastomosis after that end to end. And if we look on the ventral part, then we will see this infiltrated plica. So I would say we have better view on ultrasound than the surgeon has, if I may tell it. And what about our data from this Prague study on almost 400 patients? The sensitivity in the detection of any peritoneal infiltration, I mean also microscopic, not only macroscopic, was high, was more than 80 person. But the detection of the in detection of rectosigmoid wall infiltration was even higher. So I would say we can really use ultrasound to, to plan the resection, and this is a very important slide. If you look to the negative predictive value of PET-CT and CT, it's not adequate to, to really to assess the pelvis and to assess the detailed pelvic anatomy and to plan the rectosigmoid infiltration using these two imaging methods. And currently, according to the negative predictive value, there are exit only two methods to predict the resection and the pelvic carcinomatosis, and these are MRI and transvaginal scan. We move to the lymph nodes in the pelvis. In the pelvis, we um, evaluate on ultrasound two types of lymph nodes, the visceral lymph nodes and the parietal called retroperitoneal. This is just a patient with infiltrated lymph nodes around the sigmoid colon. This is the sigmoid colon and small lymph nodes between the osacrum, sacral bone, and the sigmoid colon. So you can recognize also the large lymph node just uh, in this ratio. And then we have the lymph Lymph nodes which are retroperitoneal. This is the interiliac bifurcation here, and there is infiltrated hypoechoic rounded lymph node. You can also visualize the vessels. Using the transvaginal or transrectal scan, you have really very detailed view on the lymph nodes on the pelvic side wall, but the results you would say are slightly disappointed. The sensitivity for ultrasound in our study was low. I think it was because we didn't combine the transvaginal scan with transabdominal at start of the study. We just used the transabdominal scan to detect the lymph nodes, which is not so reliable as to look on the pelvic lymph nodes using transvaginal scan. The structured report from the transvaginal scan should include the description of ovarian tumor, of the infiltration of uterus parametria, the infiltration of peritoneum according also the size, whether it is sheet-like, whether it is solitary lesion, whether it is just minuscule or bulky, the involvement of visceral organs, lymph nodes, the infiltration of the pelvic side wall, which is usually in case when the tumor grows in the psoas, in the muscles, in the iliac vessels, in the ureter, and evidence of hydroureter or infiltration of bowel. And we move to the abdominal staging and report. In order to assess the abdomen, this is the same as with the pelvis, we should perform the scan systematically. And it's really important to assess the metastases in the liver and in the spleen. Then we move to assess the metastatic lesion in the peritoneum. And lastly, we do the scan of the lymph nodes which are in the retroperitoneum. And we continue by the lymph nodes which are, it's not visible now, but it will be later on, which are around the mesenterial vessels and around the visceral brain of the aorta. We start with visceral organs. In order to detect the metastatic lesion in the spleen, we move just to the left upper quadrant. And in the spleen, you can find uh, benign lesions, metastatic lesion, but I would say that more frequently you find accessory spleen beyond the spleen and uh, peritoneal implants in ovarian cancer, usually in the ligamentum splenocolicum or gastrosplenicum. And there is such a case. There is a large inhomogeneous metastatic lesion very close to the hilum. So this is the metastatic lesion. And next there is a cyst, anechoic cyst with acoustic enhancement and the, the metastatic lesion, and there is an accessory spleen. It has the same echogenicity as the spleen. It is rounded and solid, 
And again, there will be probably visualized once more. This is the clear, rounded, nice accessory spin. But there, there is a nodule in the ligamentum splenocolicum between the colon and between the spleen. This is the descending colon. So this is infiltration of the supracolic omentum. And um, this is a very splenic lesion. This is the case with infiltrated supracolic omentum. But we can also find the metastatic lesion in the capsule or on the capsule of the kidneys. This is the, the, the left side. Or in the suprarenal gland, the lesions are usually inhomogeneous and hypoechoic, vascularized. And then we can find metastatic visceral uh, lesion in the, in the liver, which are hypoechoic, hypoechoic, sorry, hypoechoic, isoechoic are less visible without contrast and we do not use uh, original contrast. And the most typical are target lesion. This is the isoechoic lesion. And the most typical are target lesions with this hypoechoic rim and echogenic center. I cannot provide you with evidence from Prague study because we didn't include patients who were not operable. Antonia Testa show very nice accuracy and specificity for detection of liver and splenic metastases in her study. And we move to the peritoneum, and this is the most critical point for uh, site reduction because the infiltration of the visceral organs is usually very rarely in the primary in the primary diagnosis it's usually the case in the recurrent tumor the peritoneum the infiltration of peritoneum is divided as in the in the pelvis into the parietal carcinomatosis which is usually on the diaphragm anterior abdominal wall and paracolic gut into the visceral carcinomatosis on the surface of viscera and on the surface of the colon, into the mesenterial carcinomatosis on the mesoappendix and mesotransversum and sigmoid uh, mesocolon, and into the, <coughs> mesent the mesenterial carcinomatosis is also found in the mesentery of the small intestine. But in contrast to the pelvis, we have also the omental infiltration in abdomen because the omentum is the largest fault of peritoneum. It's included into the peritoneal carcinomatosis. And now I will provide you with some weak uh, weaknesses maybe of ultrasound in the staging. The most difficult for us, but it is also for other imaging, and I, I think that Vincent will also talk about it, is the assessment of the subdiaphragmatic ratio and the assessment of the visceral surface of the liver and spleen. And this is a typical case. There is a lesion. This is the surface of the, of the liver, and there is the diaphragm. Is this lesion on the parietal peritoneum or is it on the visceral peritoneum of the liver? You can try to move, and the lesion is fixed to the diaphragm and is slightly free against the liver. But it's really difficult to tell, uh, is it on, on diaphragm or is it on the, on the liver? And if you look on the sensitivity, it's, it's lower to detect really uh, vis visceral and uh, diaphragmatic carcinomatosis. But I would like really to emphasize that there are included patients with microscopic and macroscopic disease, not only really bulky nodules. It's very important. And I used just this graph to show results from different studies on different imaging. And there are the first two imaging <laughs> is the diffuse, uh, diffuse weighted imaging MRI and the PET CT. And this both imaging they combine functional and anatomical imaging. Therefore, it's very difficult to, to be competitive with them and we do not make any competition. But we are more close probably to contrast enhanced CT because they are poorly anatomical imaging, uh, both methods. So according to the first diagram and uh, I mean diaphragm and the uh, surface of the liver, we can see that the sensitivity sensitivity of ultrasound and CT is very close in diaphragmatic ratio, but we have real limitation in the assessment of the visceral surface of the, of the liver and spleen. And I think the main problem is the anatomical uh, locality, because it's covered behind the thoracic ratio. There is a shadows from ribs, which uh, 
which is a problem for ultrasound, we need to ask the patient to take a deep breath that the liver are pulling down from the thoracic ratio, ratio and we are able to evaluate them. And it also depends on habitus. If they are picnic people, you have real problem to evaluate the surface of liver and diaphragm. What about omentum? The omentum is divided into the lesser omentum, which is in reality the hepatododenal and hepatogastricum, and in the greater omentum. The greater omentum is further divided in relation to the transverse colon into the supra and infracolic part. What about our results? The first, I was slightly surprised that the sensitivity to detect the infiltration of the supracolic omentum was better than the infracolic omentum, but I think it's because it's clearly defined structure between the duodenum and great curvature of the stomach and the colon. So we know where we should look for. But the problem is if it's really only microscopically involved infracolic omentum without ascites, you have real problem to, to detect their infiltration. And of course that we detected better omental cake than the nodules only in the omentum. And uh, there are our results. They are slightly worse than CT, but I think it's also because we included microscopic infiltration. And what's it's really difficult, and it will be the next video, is sometimes to recognize, is it here only the omental cake or there is also the infiltration of the intestinal loops and the colon below, behind the, the omental cake. And this is the next video I will be showing now. There is the... We are by the left paracolic gutter, as, uh, ascending colon, and in front of ascending colon is large omental cake, and the omental cake is already infiltrates the anterior abdominal wall. And this is the omental cake, secum, and there will be visible ileum. So there is the ileum, ilosecal valva, ileum is free mobile, colon is free mobile against the mental cake, but we, we really need to decide will be maybe here the resection needed because of the infiltration of sacum or not. We are asked about it. So we need really to look, is it is it mobile against, I mean the colon against the mental cake? And I would say, and it was then uh, in the surgery proved, proven that it was free mobile against the omentum. So that's difficult, but if you look at our results, we are slightly better than CT, and this may be because we really have the dynamicity of the scan. We can push, we can try to push the omentum, that it moves slightly against the colon, and to have better information using dynamic scan. And the most critical, maybe, is the mesenterium of the small intestine. There are nodules, and we will find them if we follow up the mesenterial vessels. And I would say that we have high quality view of the mesentery if it's not some problem because of poor resolution. And there is the same patient on CT. And in our study, you can see the sensitivity was poor, but if you really perform, uh, included patients with visible lesions, then I think that the sensitivity was not so bad. And these are the results. The sensitivity is low, but I here we really included patients with micro, also with microscopic disease. And we move to the lymph nodes. In abdomen, again, we have the lymph nodes which are retroperitoneal, which are around the visceral branches of the viscera, which means around the celiac trunk up to the liver hilum. They run up to the splenic hilum, and they follow the superior and inferior mesenteric artery. These all are called uh, non-peripheral lymph nodes. And then we have the peripheral lymph nodes, which are usually inguinal lymph nodes infiltrated. They are palpable also. And there is a video in young patients external iliac artery, external iliac vein, and among them in the interiliac ratio is a lymph node. The, there is the interiliac bifurcation and there is a rounded lymph node. This is a young patient with breast cancer, unfortunately also with ovarian cancer, according to true cut biopsy we made from the pelvic mass. There is a lymph node with the perfusion and she had another lymph node, and this is between aorta, inferior vena cava, just um, 
very close to the bifurcation, so we call it inter aorto caval. And then we moved here, there is the superior mesenteric artery below the superior mesenteric artery, left renal vein is running, so this is the landmark for us. And next to the left from the aorta is the last lymph node. This is the left aortic or called paraortic lymph nodes. So we are able to detect lymph nodes if they are infiltrated and if they are really macroscopically infiltrated. But if we include also the microscopic, not only the macroscopic, but the microscopic, I mean the micrometastases, the sensitivity is not adequate and we always need the surgical staging of lymph nodes. And these are the final results um, of lymph nodes detection, I mean in terms of sensitivity. We have also in abdomen visceral lymph nodes, and here we have better results, but I cannot provide you with any evidence because these patients are not operated. If they have the positive lymph nodes around the celiac trunk or around the superior mesenteric artery, they are not operated, but we have very nice view to visualize the celiac trunk better than this uh, ratio, which is the most critical for us uh, during transabdominal scan to assess the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. Here, this is the deepest place for us to assess by ultrasound, but here by the celiac trunk we have again much better visibility. And this is just a patient to, to provide to you some video. There will be a portal vein, and in front of portal vein you can clearly visualize large infiltrated lymph node. There is another one. This is the portal vein. So you have very nice view of the visceral lymph nodes usually, much better than for retroperitoneum. Again, portal vein, one and second large lymph nodes, and also behind the portal vein, the lymph nodes are present. I don't want to speak about feasibility, but we know that uh, the feasibility is based not only on the information from imaging, but also on many other factors, as it was said. And Ign Professor Ignaz Fergote showed us the paper he published with Professor Andrea de but they taught us that they are, they are highly depending on the imaging results, but also on the patient characteristics and on other factors which influence the decision whether to make primary surgery or not. But only you should really know where are the localities not suitable for primary surgery because you must take care about them while you're performing and scan to inform your gynae oncologist. So these are the multiple liver metastatic lesion, infiltration of the celiac trunk, infiltration of the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery, including the radix, diffuse confluent carcinomatosis on the small intestine, diffuse carcinomatosis on the duodenum and pancreas, which would require resection, or um, non-completely resectable extra abdominal metastatic lesion. So always in your report, you should uh, take care about these localities non-suitable for primary site reduction. And uh, because we couldn't really provide you with evidence how accurate we can assess the feasibility for surgery because it is clinical decision, I just only wanted to show you that if we use ultrasound to stage the disease, we achieve very nice uh, optimal resection rate. And this, this resection rate using ultrasound is comparable to other, uh, other advanced uh, gynae oncological centers, which are using usually more sophisticated methods. So there is still some potential to use ultrasound because ultrasound is highly specific uh, methods. So ultrasound provides us with the information about the localities which are not suitable for cytoreduction very accurately, I think. Otherwise, we would not have such a low number of inadequate surgery, of suboptimal surgery. And again, the report from Tans abdominal scan should be systematic, include the infiltration of the visceral organs, of the peritoneum, of the lymph nodes, of the, the presence of ascites and fluidothorax, evidence of complication, and the summary. In the summary, as an ultrasound specialist, we should not on, only summarize our examination, including figure staging. We should also recommend the additional techniques because we may have some limitation. We would like that we will add 
MRI or we will need to do colonoscopy because we found some, some reason for that. So the additional, inform, uh, additional imaging is recommended by ultrasound expert, not by the gynae oncologist but by the specialist in imaging. And we also write about the estimate, estimated probability for true card biopsy, whether the true card biopsy is possible to be performed or not. And conclude, I, I believe that the ultrasound is the method of choice to stage the disease spread in the pelvis using transvaginal or transrectal scan, specifically for the assessment of the rectosigmoid wall infiltration. Ultrasound has an excellent kappa value in agreement, I mean, with histology. And uh, I think we can really safely use ultrasound to predict the need of rectosigmoid infiltration and to organize the team. MRI should be used as a tool solving problem for us, I mean in pelvis. Uh, just for situation, we have some limitation like the pelvic side wall invasion if we have suspicion how deep the tumor grows before the surgery. In abdomen, Ultrasound may be an accurate technique, however, it has no limitation like experienced examiner, the needs of the high quality system. It has some poor limitation of a poor visibility and also it has inherent limitation to assess the extra abdominal spread with exception of the supraclavicular lymph nodes. However, it doesn't have any contraindication. It is broadly available and non-invasive tests which can be provide immediately without any risk for patients. And it is highly specific technique, however less sensitive, but it is the same as with all imaging techniques. In the agreement between ultrasound and histology in the assessment of any peritoneal spread, any peritoneal spread, including micro and macroscopic, we had very good uh, agreement. However, we had only moderate agreement in the assessment of the retroperitoneal lymph nodes, including micro and micro metastases uh, and macro metastases. But it's still true, and I think that Vincent will not change it, that um, it doesn't exist any reliable imaging technique which can replace surgical staging. And the last slide, although the assessment of feasibility to surgery is a clinical decision, I think that ultrasound may play a role in this assessment to assess the localities not suitable for primary surgery, according to the low rate of suboptimal site reduction in my department in our study. And if you are interested in gynae oncological scan, there is a workshop and I have been asked by some colleagues during the IOTA conference, where is the next term, next date of the workshop. So if you are interested in gynae oncological scan, you are very welcome. That's all. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Daniela, many thanks. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, the ones where you said that they had um, positive lymph nodes around the celiac plexus and the superior me mesenteric, but then you didn't operate on. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, hear sorry. the start of the when, question. Sorry, when you said that they had um, positive lymph nodes around the celiac and superior mesenteric, and then obviously th then they did not have surgery. Mm -hmm. How, what was your reference technique? Yeah, what is the reference technique? If I have the infiltrated celiac trunk lymph nodes, we usually add the CT scan or PET CT because we would like to know about the mediastinum and about the additional spread of disease. So in these cases, we usually, if we decided not to operate, we need some second evidence to, to really to provide the information to the clinicians not to make the surgery. If it's clearly in the upper abdomen, we still need the information about the thorax. So in other words, you're happy with the ultrasound diagnosis of the abdominal lymph node finding, but it was a marker of possible mediastinal involvement, so you do a CT. Is that, <coughs> have I got that right? I, I, I'm, I'm speaking to you. Maybe, uh, maybe I can go. Do you want me to shout? No, I don't, I don't want to pursue the point too, too much because I think time's moving on. Uh, just for the audience, because I mean, I think obviously you work in a, a high throughput gynae oncology center. 
Um, and I think when people, I certainly remember when the first time I saw you show these videos and then I came to visit your unit. And I visited the unit because I thought, that looks difficult. Um, and give, can you give some idea of what the, what the learning curve is? Thank you. Um, and, and what sort of number of cases, because I don't, you know, I, I, I think it's hard to, to so obviously if you, you probably shouldn't be doing this unless you are in an oncology center because you're not going to be staging them anyway. But how long did it take you to, and how many cases to become comfortable with this? Important questions. I think there are many colleagues here who really do gynae oncological scan and attended my department so they would reply better than me. But I am pretty sure that if you have a large amount of patients referred with pathological scan to your department and you have the opportunity to visit the surgery and to check your findings with the surgery, you are becoming better and better because you know, oh, I miss this lymph node or I miss this cake. So they are th my PhD students and I think they learned very quickly and they are really able to assess at least really bulky disease not suitable for primary site reduction. Of course, that always we, like a senior uh, consultant, we must, we must c control such a very important decision, operate and not operate. So it's, they are the first initial examiners and then we see the patients before the surgery is performed yes 